Good evening and welcome to the October 12th, 2021 uh, Brentwood City Council Successor Agency Meeting. Uh, pursuant to Section 54956 of the California Government Code, a special meeting of the City Council is hereby called for October 12th, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. And uh, we could get a roll call, please. Council Member Mendoza? Here. Council Member Meyer? Here. Council Member Rary? Here. Vice Mayor Rodriguez? Here. Mayor Bryant? Here. Okay, we do have a quorum, so at this time we will open public comments. Uh, Margaret? At this time, the public is permitted to address the City Council on items that are on the closed session agenda. I received zero written public comments on this item prior to the meeting. If you wish to speak under public comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature, and I'll call upon your name if provided and immediately you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. While we encourage your comments, state law prevents the city council from discussing items that are not on their meeting agenda. If appropriate, staff will follow up on them. And I'm seeing no hands raised. Okay, at this time we will close public comment and I need a motion for adjournment to close session. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 It is unanimous. We are adjourned to closed session. How was vacation? Vacation good? Yes. Good. Good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the October 12th, 2021 City Council Successor Agency meeting with the City of Brentwood. Um, and we do have a quorum. Uh, Margaret, could I get a roll call? Council Member Mendoza? Here. Council Member Meyer? Here. Council Member Rary? Here. Vice Mayor Rodriguez? Here. Mayor Bryant? Here. Uh, and there is nothing to report out from our closed session. Uh, if we could all join together uh, in Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we will open public comments, and I'll turn it to you, Margaret. At this time, the public is permitted to address the City Council on items that are not on the agenda. Items listed under informational reports or the consent calendar. Request for future agenda items, new requests. Please save your comments for any other items on the agenda for that part of the meeting when you'll have the opportunity to provide them. I received no written public comments that were submitted um, prior to the meeting. If you wish to speak under public comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature and I'll, in, I'll call your name and if provided and unmute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. While we encourage your comments, state law prevents the city council from discussing items are, that are not on their meeting agenda, and if appropriate, staff will follow up on them. And I'm seeing no hands raised for public comment. Okay, at this time then, we will close public comments. Uh, move on to item A1, a proclamation uh, issued to Rotary International in observance of October 24th, 2021 as World Polio Day. And uh, I will be uh, presenting this to Dana Eaton, uh, the Rotary Club of Brentwood president. Is Mr. Eaton with us this evening? And if not, I will read the proclamation. I do not see him online. Okay. Well, I do want to thank Mr. Eaton for everything that he and the Rotary Club of Brentwood do uh, for our, our community. 
Uh, so the proclamation is this, whereas Rotary is a global network of neighbors, friends, leaders, and problem solvers who unite and take action to create lasting change in communities across the globe, and whereas the Rotary motto, service above self, inspires members to provide humanitarian service, follow high ethical standards, and promote goodwill and peace in the world, and whereas Rotary in 1985 launched Polio Plus and in 1988 helped establish the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, which today includes the World Health Organization, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, UNICEF and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance to Immunize the Children of the World Against Polio, and whereas polio cases have dropped by 99.9% .9 since 1988, and the world stands on the threshold of eradicating the disease, and whereas to date Rotary has contributed more than $2.2 billion and countless volunteer hours to protecting nearly 3 billion children in 122 countries, and whereas Rotary is working to raise an additional 50 million per year, which would be leveraged for maximum impact by the additional 100 million annually from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And whereas these efforts are providing much needed operational support, medical staff, laboratory equipment, and educational materials for health workers and parents. And whereas, in addition, Rotary has played a major role in decisions by donor governments to contribute more than 10 billion to the effort. And whereas there are over 1.2 million Rotary members in 36,000 clubs throughout the world that sponsor service projects to address such critical issues as poverty, disease, hunger, illiteracy, and the environment in their local communities and abroad. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Brentwood does hereby proclaim October 24th World Polio Day and encourage all citizens to join me and Rotary International in the fight for a polio-free world, dated this 12th of October, 2021, signed by myself and on behalf of the City Council. So we will move on to uh, informational reports, uh, and I'll start with my left this time, Council Member Meyer. And I'm going to remember my mic this time. <laughs> um, let's see. Had a meeting with the Somerset Board of Directors and uh, staff member Steve Kurzavan about um, congestion and traffic safety for Somerset residents, but also students of Ron Nunn Elementary. Um, attended the Brentwood Boulevard specific plan open house um, hosted by the city. I thought it was a, a really informational educational meeting. Um, I really appreciated the chance to hear from people throughout, you know, the Brentwood Boulevard area and hear what their concerns were. I, I was I was impacted a lot by some of the things we heard. There was a lot of concerns and fears that I think we need to address when we do this again um, to talk about not just what we see, foresee for the future, but address some of the concerns we heard that night. Um, people were a little concerned about things like, am I gonna be pushed out of my neighborhood? Uh, it was a very impactful meeting. And um, we had Olivia Alvarez doing translation. She did an ama amazing job. Staff did a fantastic job facilitating the meeting. Um, thanks to everyone involved. I was really pleased to be there. Uh, had a meeting with uh, Captain Herbert from the Brentwood PD about some of the agenda items. Also met with Mickey Sabota and Carrie Bream and Alexis Morris about agenda items. Um, attended a Brentwood Lions meeting to hear presentations by Working Wonders on their new physical site in Brentwood, which was really exciting. And the Brentwood Regional Community Chest about their holiday toy drive coming up. Um, I'm sure we'll all report out on that as we learn more about it. Attended along with Casey Wickard and uh, Public Works, the East Contra Costa Groundwater Sustainability Plan meeting. There's a lot to learn about um, groundwater sustainability. I'm, I'm in the beginning stages of trying to educate myself. Um, went to the Bedford Block Party. It was an event in Antioch, but it's to serve older adults and those with disabilities throughout East County. Brentwood is included within that. It was a fundraiser. It's an adult day healthcare program, really great event. Um, had a meeting in person with the Dolphin Park residents, and I think 
I'd, I'd re seen the emails and spoken to people on the phone, but when you when you get there in person, see the park and have you know talk with them about it, it was a very different experience from what I'd, I thought it was going to be. Um, so that was really great. I love to have meetings with the constituents. If anybody's out there listening, um, met with the executive director of Adventure Therapy Foundation, who was doing some. Um, just connecting with, she wants to reach out to council and let us know that she's there for resources. At, right before this evening, went to the Shadow Lakes Neighborhood Watch Fall Festival to try and do a little, hello, I'm here, remember? <laughs> uh, attended part of the mayor's conference and I think that covers it all. Thank you. Council Member Ray. Boy, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Um, since we uh, last met, I, I went on vacation for a week in, in Texas and talk about a little culture shock there. But um, I, I attended today's Board of Supervisors meeting, um, which started at 10 and when I logged off at 5.30 to attend our closed session, it was still going on. So. Um, one of the uh, reasons I attended was because of the Measure X. Um, they they did bring their items to, the Measure X committee did bring their items to the, the uh, Board of Supervisors tonight and requested that $20,000 uh, be spent to uh, on a report writer to consolidate everything that they've gathered, all their polls and um, information since they, they started attending six months ago. And while East County Fire is on that list, um, I still don't think that it's being shined on enough. Um, I do think that um, we have an opportunity as a council to send a letter, not just the resolution, but a letter of the reasons why we should, um, and I'll, I'll ask for that at the end of the, the meeting, but why, why it's important that we fund um, East County Fire. And um, also, um, on November 2nd, all of this will be coming back to the Board of Supervisors tonight. They just kind of, or today, they just wanted to kind of look it over, absorb it, have time to absorb it, and then are going to really do the discussion on November 2nd. So I would suggest that our um, residents um, out here in East County start writing your letters and letting them know what is important to you. Um, and also for the council members to, to speak on that day um, as a citizen or um, as a representative with what our letter to the, the Board of Supervisors states. Um, I, I think it's really important that we continue to bring it up um, on because one of the concerning things that was said is that Measure X funds can be used for anything. It's voted in now. It can basically, you know, be used for anything, which is a scary thing considering that fire and hospital and 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 child um, uh, ser child services and and mental health services was all part of it, but they've just kind of changed the order and have created all kinds of new pockets. And so it was kind of scary how it all turned out today. So I, I implore everybody to send a, an email, contact uh, your Board of Supervisors, all five of the Board of Supervisors to let them know um, how you feel. Um, and the other thing that came up was um, the masking indoors, the public health order. And um, they anticipate by December, um, possibly January, it should be lifted in Contra Costa County. So um, it needs to be at the yellow level um, based on the CDC, the yellow tier based on the CDC. I think they said that should take place by next month. It needs to have 75 or less hospitalizations. Um, we are already at that. And um, then it needs to be 80% of all residents. Um, and I think we are at 72% countywide for all residents, not just 12 and over, but all residents. Um, and or eight weeks past the time that um, the FDA has uh, 
approved an emergency um, vaccine for um, for five to 12 year olds. So that's that was a report out on that very long meeting today. Um, I also attended a how to assess the Economic Development Administration's $3 billion in ARPA funds to build back better. And um, as soon as I got done with that webinar, I contacted uh, Joshua Ewan in our Economic Development Department and said, hey, um, what are we doing about this? Is This would be perfect for the um, northern waterfront. And he, he says, yes, that's already being done. I says, it might even be good if we can pull it all together for ag enterprise funds. Um, he says, yeah, well, that might be a little tougher considering that the deadline was, I think, today. <laughs> and that was uh, over a week ago. So, yeah, that was a little tough to do. Um, but anyway, and as you saw today, we received that uh, letter that the city is sending to the, the county supporting the, um, that, that grant that we're requesting or that the county's requesting. Um, I also met with Cap and Herbert uh, to discuss several PD items related um, items on tonight's consent calendar. Um, and I met with Assistant City, Acting Assistant City Manager Tom Hansen regarding his new job transition, economic development, staff development, and future growth. And that is all I have to report. Thank you. I thought you said you were on vacation. <laughs> oh, this time we'll turn it to uh, Councilperson Mendoza. Hi. Um, since last time we met, um, again, I had another uh, day at Dolphin, well, not day, you know, some time at Dolphin Park. Um, it was getting slow. They said it gets slow come um, the fall, but they are excited that we are going to be looking this year at solutions for them for next year so that hopefully we don't have the same issues. Attended the Brentwood Boulevard specific plan um, with. Um, you know, Councilmember Meyer and Rodriguez. And uh, it was very interesting because I could hear concerns from people and the consultants were not hearing their concerns, which actually kind of upset me. These people were upset about um, gentrification and displacement and what's gonna happen to their homes. And it was kind of getting washed over a little bit by the consultant, which was a little bit upsetting. Um, Olivia did a great job translating, but um, I think we can do a better job at listening to their concerns. And what are we going to do about that? Is displacement really something we need to be concerned about? Because the answer was like, oh, well, if you own your home, it's fine. But we know we have a lot of people that don't own, they rent. So we need to figure out, is the Brentwood specific plan good for the people of Brentwood, the people who live here? Because if it's, if it's going to hurt residents, I don't know how I feel about it going forward. Um, and the other thing, I listened in on the Vallejo, Martin, um, Vallejo meeting because they were re reviewing the mass mandate, wanted to see what other cities were, were doing. They're upholding their mass mandate. Um, watched the Antioch City Council meeting um, regarding the CRC pipeline um, just to see what they had to say about it because we had the same thing um, not long ago. So I want to hear their perspective. I have to say that a lot of heritage students showed up. I am beyond impressed with the heritage students that showed up and the way they vocalized their concerns for their health and their safety. It was pretty cool to listen to them. Um, had more oil and gas drilling calls because that is coming to the county and we need to be watching for that, um, waiting for that report to happen. Was on a call with Livable um, California with residents across the state regarding um, land use. Um, ha had a meeting, um, oh, actually attended a fundraiser via Zoom from Lafayette and there was a lot of attorneys and professors there talking about land use and what's going to be happening forward and how homes have now become commodities like a stock option. It's not anymore what it was before, like you buy your house and that's where you live. Um, we're seeing a lot of international investment. So how do we protect our residents so that they can continue to get that American dream of owning a home? Also attended a groundwater meeting. Um, there is some concerns about the groundwater quality with oil and gas drilling that we need to make sure everything is covered. Um, got some calls from the businesses on Brentwood Boulevard. They're really excited about the grants and, you know, sent those questions to Josh. And Josh has been amazing. He has gone out there and met with them. He calls and checks and sees everything's okay. So um, I want to thank staff for doing that. I think that goes a long way for the community to know that we really are listening to them and that we care about what they're doing. Um, had a radio interview for the initiative that I'm part of on land use and um, land use control from a city perspective. And um, we'll be coming to the city for support on a resolution to support that initiative. Um, 
And, you know, we come here and we talk about everything that's great. You know, all these calls that happen, they're great. I had one really awful call this um, week with a nonprofit. And sometimes I think that expectations of some people and what we are is not what we are. And um, I will say this, that if I get calls and someone is disrespectful, you can come here for three minutes and tell me what you think, but I don't have to sit on the phone and take it. So where we all talk about how great everything is, they are not all great calls. We have some that are not that great. So if you want to yell at me, you can yell at me for three minutes, signed up for that. Yelling on my personal phone, didn't sign up for that. So that's my week. <laughs> um, since our last meeting, we had no committee meetings. I wasn't involved in any of the committees that I'm involved in, had any meetings. I did participate in the community uh, workshop on Brentwood Boulevard specific plan. Um, I just want to ditto uh, what both council members had said. And also I want to thank both council members for attending. Um, we thought it was a pretty good meeting. I think there's things that we can improve in regards to how we uh, navigate those meetings and present them. Um, and you know, hopefully those will be some of the next steps when we're talking. I'm also hoping that what are some of the next steps that now that we've heard from I'd say about between 60 to 65 residents from that area. Uh, what are some of the next steps in regards to um, our consultant and what are they gonna do with that information, those kind of things. So I'd like to get a little bit of an um, update on that and what that would look like. Uh, I also was involved in doing the outreach for the Brentwood Boulevard uh, specific plan. Uh, we walked about 500 homes, um, you know, obviously a lot of communication and actually did do a lot of follow-up meetings after the Brentwood Boulevard specific plan. Um, we had a lot of meetings after the meeting uh, that happened that night, just to see how the community felt and also um, get positive feedback in regards to how we can even do better for the future. Um, also met with other residents pertaining to other things uh, regarding the community. And uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Since our last meeting, uh, I attended a ribbon cutting uh, for a new business here in town. Also, I attended the mayor's conference. Uh, I had a meeting with Lil Pierce uh, with the community chest, and uh, that is, again, uh, the community chest does such an outstanding job of helping our families here in our community during the holiday seasons, and that time is upon us again, and I'm sure that uh, the community chest representatives will be coming to council at some point in public comments, uh, encouraging the community to once again uh, help with uh, bringing toys and food products. Uh, this is one of the events that makes Brentwood really feel like home. Uh, we, we really genuinely care about our families and our families get to help take care of our families uh, with food and, and toys and it's always a wonderful event. Uh, last year we had an outstanding uh, turnout and I'm sure this year we will as well. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, Lil and the community chest will be contacting us about that. Also met uh, with Captain Herbert uh, regarding uh, some uh, issues uh, that, are, that are on our uh, agenda. Also, I met with several uh, state representatives and uh, community representatives in the Bay Area regarding homeless and some actual implementable answers uh, that we can we can. Um, eventually answer some of these multifaceted concerns and questions. There's not going to be one magic solution or decision. It's going to take numerous different things that we can work as communities and, and cities with. Um, and I met on every single day for the last week and a half. I have been meeting with residents regarding different issues in the community. And uh, like like council member um, Mendoza said, some of them were, were wonderful and some of them were serious, but it's very important that we as council members do hear uh, what the community is feeling and saying so that we can be informed and make the proper decisions. So thank you all that uh, met with me and reached out. Uh, I really appreciate it. And with that, I have nothing more to report under informational items. Mayor, I just wanna say one thing I, I forgot. I also wanted to thank our, um, I was actually leaving to work today, and I happened to be one of the first people that showed up at the fire that was going on on Dainty Road there in one of the courts. And I really just want to take this time to recognize, so I was there before police, fire, and everybody else showed up um, trying to help out whatever we could. But in saying that, I just wanted to um, 
thank our firemen that, from our local firemen, but also I know surrounding fire um, stations were involved because, I mean, driving. I was driving when I left. They were still coming from Antioch. So I just want to thank them for a wonderful job that they did. But also our local police department. I was able to see them actually hands-on out there really doing their part in getting the residents out of their homes and getting them out of the area. So I just wanted to recognize our police department, but also um, our fire stations local, I mean, locally, but also within Brentwood that did a wonderful job there. So I just wanted to be able, because I actually was there to see it. It was, I, want, I, didn't want, I don't want to say it was a nice thing to see because you don't want to see those kind of things, but seeing them do it in action and really being out there was really um, an experience. So thank you guys. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to consent calendar, um, do I have a motion for consent? Make a motion uh, to adopt the consent uh, calendars items C.1 through C.4. I'll second that. We have a first and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? It is unanimous. Um, we will move now on to business items. Uh, we'll now hear item D1, which is the City Council's consideration of the in issuance of capital improvement revenue, refunding bonds, and associated actions. And Carrie Breen will now present on this item. Carrie? And it's nice to see you in person again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one moment while I get the presentation into Zoom. Okay, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. So these next two agenda items are seeking your approval for the refinancing of the existing 2012 CIP bonds. As a refresher, the 2012 bonds began life back in 2001 when a bond issuance financed projects for roadways, the redevelopment agency, and the tech center. The bonds were refinanced to a lower interest rate in 2012 and are eligible to be refinanced again on or after November 1st of this year. There is currently $14.2 million outstanding on those bonds. So back on July 26th, the City Council authorized staff to begin the refinance process, but also instructed staff not to commit the City until after additional approval from the Council, which staff is seeking tonight. Also on July 26th, as a part of that discussion, the City Council instructed that a potential refinance should remove existing restrictions on the use of the Tech Center. While the goal of the refinance is to save the City money, the removal of these restrictions will also allow the Council to consider additional options when the time comes for a discussion of the future use of that building. Following the City Council's initial approval on July 26th, the City's placement agent submitted bid requests to 13 banks. Five banks responded, with City National Bank offering the most favorable terms for the City. These terms include an all-in interest rate of 1.61%, with a provision allowing the City to refinance again if it chooses in five years. The total savings from the refinance would be $2.66 million over 10 years. This would be available as uh, resources for the strategic planning session that we'll be talking about in about a month. The maturity date for the bonds would remain 2031. If the City Council approves the refinance tonight, the transaction would close around November 2nd. We have our fiscal advisor, placement agent, and bond legal counsel available for any questions. This concludes my presentation tonight. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff? Yeah, uh, Carrie, I have one question. So for 10 years, it would be 265000 I'm sorry. And yes, that's correct. That, that's it, right? Yes, the city is not committed to any debt service beyond the 10 years, so we would save $266,000 for the next 10 years, at which point there is no more debt service at that. After or that. we just take a lump sum, which is 
two point six. Or the, internally, we could finance that two hundred sixty-six thousand, make the two point six six million available to the council for a one-time project as part of the strategic planning process. So it's kind of an either-or on that. So for ten years, we have this coming to us. To us, Thank you. Okay. Any further questions of staff? Okay. Seeing none at this time, we will open public comment. I'll turn it to you, Margaret. I received zero written public comments on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature and I'll call upon your name if provided and immediately to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. And I do have one hand raised. I'll call on Ian Cohen. Mr. Cohen, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Good evening, Council. So I have two questions. How would this affect the Youth Center Feasibility Project? And the second one, if the refinance goes through so the city can save money and the youth and the tech center is sold, where would this money go to? I have, um, thank you for letting me speak. I have no additional speakers with their hands raised. At this time, we will close public comments. Uh, Steph, if, are you able to answer the, the questions of the, the speaker? Yes, certainly. The, the use of the tech center, the future use of the tech center, that's, it's up for council decision, uh, probably during the strategic plan process. Um, not, a, not really a, a something we're gonna discuss tonight, I don't believe. Uh, what this would do though, in terms of would it be a youth center or something else, this removes restrictions. So essentially the council has a full menu of options uh, with w w whichever direction they'd like to go with the ultimate use of the facility prior to this refinance or if the refinance doesn't go through, the tech center has a lot of restrictions on it. It can only be used for governmental purposes or it can only be used for nonprofit purposes. After the refinance, if it goes through, that removes those and it can be used, sold, as, as any facility, it's no longer encumbered um, by the bonds at that point, the restrictions of the bonds. Um, the other other question, oh, what, where would the funds go if we sold the facility? Again, that would be a, a council discussion. Um, again, that not related to this, whether or not the, the facility is sold isn't related to the refinance. Uh, that would be something the council would have to decide how they wanted to use those proceeds if, if, if and when they wanted to sell the building. Thank you. There are no further council questions of staff. Uh, is there further discussion? And if not, uh, is there a motion? I, I do have a question. Um, weren't there, I, I'm looking at the the red agenda and it, it weren't there two choices that we could make or was there just one choice? Is it just that with the, um, I'm going through through the staff report right now. Or is it just the one that that removes the restrictions? The way it's it's written, it removes the restrictions. In July, we did ask for direction on okay. whether or not to remove those restrictions. I, I just remembered that. And so as I'm looking at, at the red agenda I'm going okay but it's not giving us an either or so I'll make a motion um, as detailed in the staff report adopt a resolution as to issuance of capital improvement revenue refunding bonds and associated actions I'll second, second that <laughs> we have a first and a second all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed it is unanimous we will move on to item D2, a resolution of the governing board of the Brentwood Infrastructure Financing Authority, approving the issuance of capital improvement revenue refunding bonds and associated actions. Uh, as this item is the BIFA portion of the item we just heard, we do not need an additional presentation. And if there are no further questions from the board about this item, uh, then I will open public comment. Uh, Margaret. I received no written public comments on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature 
and I'll call upon your name if provided and mute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. And I have no hands raised. Okay, at this time then we will close public comments. Uh, if there are no further speakers, uh, if there are any questions of staff regarding this. I just have a comment. I want to say, Carrie, I mean, even before I was here, you're awesome at what you do. So thank you so much and thank you for going out and doing the work. It's funny, I asked someone at the school district, I'm like, are you guys refinancing your bonds? You know, so thank you for doing all of the work. I really appreciate it. It's, I mean, you do an awesome job with the city finances. So thank you. Do I have a motion on this item? I'll make a motion as detailed in the staff report, adopt a resolution to the issuance capital improvement revenue refunding bonds and associated actions. Okay, we have a first. I'll second that. And a second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? It is unanimous. Uh, we will move on to item D3, uh, selection of a consultant to perform the housing element update and associated tasks. Community Development Director Alexis Morris will now present on this item. Alexis. Thank you. All right, bear with me a little on the job training. <laughs> Sorry. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. The item before you tonight is the award of a consulting contract for the housing element update, safety element update, and climate action plan project, which was included in the CIP adopted by the Council on June 22nd of this year. For background, a certified housing element is one of seven mandatory elements of the general plan. The city is required to submit a housing element to the state by January 2023. State law also requires local jurisdictions to update the safety element of the general plan when updating the housing element. A climate action plan is a detailed framework for measuring, planning, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The housing element update, safety element update, and the climate action plan project were combined into a single project in the CIP in order to streamline the consultant selection process. Staff released a request for proposals for the project on July 9th. The RFP was distributed to 28 firms via email and posted on the city's website, and staff followed up with the majority of the firms encouraging them to submit. The city received one response to the RFP from Kim Lee Horn. The proposal included, that should be past tense, a proposed budget of $626,045, plus optional tasks totaling $63,670, with a schedule that runs through September 2023. While it is not ideal to receive one proposal in response to an RFP, it was not unexpected for the cycle of the housing element update. The entire nine county Bay Area region is undergoing the housing element update process at the same time. And there's a limited pool of consultant firms that are qualified to prepare housing elements. Kim Lee Horn has extensive experience in preparing housing elements and staff contacted five of the references listed in the proposal and received positive feedback from all of them. Bill Wiseman from Kimley Horn is on the line tonight as well to answer any questions that council may have. Staff brought the one proposal we received to LUD for a the Land Use and Development Committee, I'll refer to it as LUD going forward, for a recommendation on how to proceed. Staff provided LUD with a comparison of housing element costs from five other cities in the county, which ranged from $160,000 to $850,000 and provided LUD with an information about how many proposals those firms, those cities received, which ranged from zero to three. LUD directed staff to bring the Kimley Horn proposal to the city council tonight for consideration. LUD asked that we uh, staff ask Kimley Horn for reductions to the budget 
and to provide budgets for the cities of Walnut Creek and Dublin to council for comparison purposes. And those budgets were attached to the staff report. Ludd also asked staff to ask the council to clarify the scope of the climate action plan portion of the project and whether council intended for the city to adopt a standalone climate action plan or to focus the work on implementing elements of the conservation and open space policies that are outlined in the general plan. Two different things. In response to staff's request to reduce the budget, Kimley Horn revised their proposal to reduce the budget by $22,810 through removing some tasks and including them as optional tasks instead. The proposed budget is larger than the comparison cities of Dublin and Walnut Creek. The city's project includes a climate action plan, which the other cities don't, and includes preparation of an EIR, which is more expensive than the other cities' secret processes, which were proposing mitigated negative declarations. I think I froze, sorry. The proposed budget for the climate action plan portion of the project is $124,380. The climate action plan would be a standalone document, but was included in the overall CIP project because as I said, it would streamline consultant selection. and would use the same sources of, as funds as the housing element and the safety element updates portion of the project. The preparation of a climate action plan is included in the general plan as action item COS8C, which is also attached to the staff report. Ludd had some discussion of whether the council intended for a full standalone climate action plan to be part of the CIP project, or whether the council intended a different approach, such as work, working on the broader general plan goals related to climate change and the environment. Ludd recommended that staff bring this to council with the contract for discussion and direction on whether a full climate action plan should be included in the project or not. Therefore, when considering the, considering the consultant agreement tonight, staff is recommending that the council consider the following options for the climate pack action plan in discussion. Option one would authorize the execution of the contract for a housing element update, safety element update, and a climate action plan in the amount of $626,045. Option two would authorize the execution of the contract for only a housing element and safety element update in the amount of $501,665. Neither option includes the optional tasks. These tasks include the website uh, for housing element information, community online community surveys, additional council meetings, and an environmental justice analysis if it became necessary to do one. These can be included in the project budget, budget if council wishes. The amounts in the resolution would just need to be adjusted accordingly. The overall CIP budget approved by council in June was $400,000. If council moves forward with option one, then the overall CIP budget would need to be increased by $291,000 $291,045, sorry. If the council decided to move forward with option two, the overall CIP budget would need to be increased by $166,665. In conclusion, staff is recommending that the council considerizing, consider authorizing the city manager to execute a contract with Kim Lee Horn as either option one, which includes a climate action plan, or option two, without a climate action plan. And as I said, a representative from Kim Lee Horn is here to answer questions of council. Thank you. Questions of staff? I have a question. When we met with Ludd, um, I think council member Rary and I were confused about the ask from council member Meyer. And um, we need a clarification. Did you, after that meeting, did you reach out to council Meyer to get clarification on her ask? Not specifically. I put it, we brought it to council for the broader council discussion. That was my understanding. I didn't bring it to just council member Meyer. 
Yeah, I thought we wanted you to ask her to get clarification before we move forward on it. Just like, is this what she asked for or not? Right, am I mistaken in that? There was a lot of things asked for that day. Um, I, I know that we we were concerned that that what Councilmember um, Meyer had asked for was was not this. Um, it would have been nice to at least had that information for the staff report um, prior to coming here, but. Um, that's something we can discuss at this at, during our discussion time. So I apologize if I misunderstood. I rewatched the meeting and read my notes, and I understood the discussion that we needed the council direction on whether the climate action plan should move forward. It is in the CIP. In order to change that, it would take an action of the council. So I apologize if I misunderstood the direction. I, I just think what it. we voted on is not what you heard. I, it's just it's just hard, and I think it's something we have to work through. We vote on some things, and we believe we're voting on something else, and then something totally different happens. So I think we just need to work on our communication because, I mean, this is something that's fixable, but what if, some, what if in the future it's not fixable and something m more drastic happens and something that we spend a lot of tax dollars on or something along those lines? That's my concern sitting here right now. So. I understood I'm happy to follow up with you directly about that. Like I said, I rewatched the meeting and I must have misunderstood the direction. Um, I understood it to be to bring back to the council the discussion of the climate action plan. Council has to make the decision in order to change the CIP. So I apologize if I misconstrued that information. Okay. Is there any further questions of, of staff regarding this? Uh, I, I do have a couple of questions just for clarification. Uh, what is the benefit of doing the EIR for the community's sake uh, on, on this particular uh, request? So an EIR is the most conservative approach to the CEQA analysis. Um, EIRs have different thresholds in court if our housing element were to be challenged. I don't know if, if Katie wants to weigh in on that as well, the, um, but an EIR is, um, has different criteria if someone were to challenge our housing element on the basis of our CEQA analysis, um, and it's more robust in court for the city, offers more protections. Okay, thank you. And also, uh, what's the cost difference uh, in the CAP? The cost difference in what, I'm sorry? Uh, doing a CAP uh, or not. So without the CIP in the project, it takes $124,000 out of the budget. So it reduces the budget to um, option two on the staff report, the table. It reduces the budget by $124,000 to $566,665. Right. That's all the questions I have. Oh, yes, Council Member Meyer. I'll get into my um, comments after a public comment, but uh, for the sake of, of clarification for the public, can you please explain what the difference is between a general plan conservation and open space element and a recognized CAP? Sure. So our general plan conservation and open space element has broad policies related to uh, climate, greenhouse gases, um, protecting open space views and hillsides, air quality emissions, um, it's very broad and it's based, it was adopted by council as part of the general plan process. A, and it's basically council policy is directed and decided by council. A climate action plan is a very specific type of document that's specifically about measuring and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And it's tied to state goals in terms of establishing a baseline and targets for reductions over time. Um, so it's a very specific type of program and plan. And what does the state require? What does it require? It requires a measurement of our greenhouse gases to establish a baseline. It, is it requires a reduction target to be created, and it requires the council to come up with policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to meet that target. 
and that would be for city operations, municipal operations, development projects, it would be for a wide ranging type of activities. Thank you, I'll save the rest for later. Did you say that, um, that what the state requires would be part, that measurement part would be part of the safety element? Not the baseline greenhouse gas measurement. Yep. What the uh, state requires is climate resiliency to be a part of the safety element. So it's a little different. It's not just about greenhouse gas reductions. It's about the impact of climate change on our city. Okay. If there are no further questions of staff, and at this time we will open public comment. Margaret. I received zero written public comments on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature. I'll call upon your name if provided and unmute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. And I have two hands raised. I'll start with Rod followed by Ian Cohen. Rod, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Um, just briefly, uh, just based on what I just heard, um, I'm interested in hearing more about um, how we can relate uh, open space preservation within Brentwood to our uh, efforts to reduce greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases. Um, as you all know, I'm, I'm very interested in saving all of the open space that we have left in Brentwood that is currently designated open space. Um, and if there is a, um, a tie in here, I would certainly like to hear, hear about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker is Ian Cohen. Ian, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right. I have one, one quick question. How, with this environmental, um, the CIP, I forgot its full name or whatever, this climate plan, how would the greenhouse gases be measured? And would this affect every single city operation, such as solid waste, for example, our police, like, every vehicle the city uses and how does it measure on like the resident basis like individual homes or development projects all right thank you there's no additional speakers with their hands raised okay. thank you so at this time we'll open uh, council discussion can we ask uh, staff to answer the questions absolutely the second question. The, um, so there's a lot of estimating that happens in order to get a baseline greenhouse gas measurement and inventory. Um, it's based on the number of residences, vehicle trips, number of city facilities, city cars. Um, so I'm not, I won't pretend to be an expert on how that's done. There's a lot of calculations. It's basically modeling similar to how you model traffic flows and impacts. They use a number of assumptions and create a model to come up with baseline greenhouse gas measure, measurements. And then that model is also used to measure the impacts of the potential reduction measures that might, might be drafted. And would the protection of open space have an impact on the greenhouse gas measurements? So that would be potentially a measure, let's say if you limited development or if development is within a more compact footprint that could be used as some of the assumptions for the future development of Brentwood and how that might impact the model versus more sprawling development that might go into open space would have a different impact on, on greenhouse gas emissions. So it would go into the bigger model. Should I just keep going? Absolutely. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, in response to the questions, um, from Council Member Rary and Council Member Mendoza, there, there was some confusion around my initial request and what uh, was eventually put together for the staff report and the presentation. And part of that was because um, we, we missed a step where we typically will present uh, and request an agenda item and then it comes back to Council for the full um, hashing out so that we can figure out you know if, if the request is met by a potential policy change or whatever it is. And, I, I watched just about every single meeting last night trying to find where that happened. Um, my request for this agenda item was in May, but I didn't see that. I didn't see it come back and I thought maybe it was all rolling together. So I think, I think if we had the chance to have that full-blown discussion, it would look a little different now. 
Um, but since we are here, I, I can clarify. Um, Alexis and I had a, a, a good discussion about this. I, I talked with Carrie about it. I've, I've tried to reach out to a lot of different sources about it. But um, the general plan does have language in it that has been complemented um, by, for example, the, uh, where did I write it down? So the former mayor of Moraga, who's also part of the Contra Costa County climate leaders. Um, there are groups that have looked at our general plan uh, where it discusses climate change and said, wow, you guys are doing really great, innovative, progressive work if you actually <coughs> start with your action items. So the, the, the suggestion of a plan is there, but the plan was not implemented. And I think that's where our concern has been, and that's what I was trying to address. So, um, and, I, and I'll bring back later on um, as an agenda item later this evening, trying to make sure that we follow the process in the right way so we're all really clear about all that. But for now, I can say that it wasn't specifically a standalone CAP I was looking for. It was more the implementation of these really great, strong, progressive moves that uh, action items that were listed in the general plan but have not yet been implemented. I would like to see action there. And that was more of my goal. Hope that helps. That that's what I understood it to be. So, for example, if I look at one of the items here, work with Contra Costa County and the Bay Area Quality Management District to implement programs um, aimed at improving air quality, right? Like there's one that's happening that has a ton of calls to back me. And I know that the city's heard about the issue up in Shadow Lakes and Brentwood Hills. So it's on our list. What are we doing about it, right? There's all this stuff that we could be doing now. So I, that's what I understood it, you as asking for in your original ask, so thank you for the clarification. And I think when it comes to the, the overall project, it's something we have to do. There's legally no way around it. Um, hopefully next time we get way ahead of it and we have cost savings. Um, I think we probably could have had cost savings had we gone out earlier, but that's done and dead in the water. But um, I, I would think we move forward without the Climate Action Plan and they get together as a council and really what do we want to see from from a climate perspective right there's stuff going on right now in our county that i think we need to be more involved in so i say we strip that away talk about exactly what we think that looks like and then um, move forward with either a climate action plan or the steps that we already have in there but i think that you know i would feel better about that because i don't even understand all of these climate action plan and who does it and what they're measuring and all that good stuff. And I think part of that too, like I said, I'm going to be I'll, later on today, I'll bring, um, or this evening, I'll bring that back. But I would agree if I have, if I wasn't clear that I do not feel the need to include the CAP in the, um, the rest of this package, if you will, um, I would, uh, I would even make a motion if everyone was ready for that, if there aren't further questions. Well, no, I, I just want to make a comment too, okay. is that I, I, I too, <laughs> thought that that was kind of the gist that you were trying to get to and, and the reason why we did ask that it come back to the council for that discussion. And I mean, to be honest, if, if, if we had the time, I'd say let's dump this proposal and go back out. But we started late. I mean, we started way too late in doing this and so we're, we're kind of stuck with this. Um, unfortunately, it's costing our residents 100,000, 166,000 more than, than what another city is doing um, with the same consultant. Uh, so that, that's, that's bothersome. Um, granted, uh, we need to do it and you go ahead and make the motion. And I just have a quick question though. Uh, I know the recommendations from staff were, you know, options A, one and two. Um, there wasn't, what happens without that portion of it in there? Is it a big impact to the report or what, what does that look like in regards to option one and two? Not just the money perspective, obviously we we'll say money, right? But what, it, what would that do to the um, actual report that we could get? If the climate action plan were removed from the project, yeah, would it be? It, it would have. It wouldn't have any effect on the housing element or the safety element update. Those are independent documents, um, so would not have any impact on that work or those drafts. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, do we have a motion? 
As detailed in the staff report, adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager or designee to execute an agreement and necessary documents for consulting services with Kinley Horn in the amount of $566,665 for option two, including only the housing element update and safety element update and amending the CIP budget and operating budget accordingly. I'll second that. We have a first and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, it is unanimous. We will move on to um, item D4. Um, here presentation on the council chamber audio visual system and Mike Barrio will present on this item. And as, as we're waiting for Mike to come, and I know this is not on the agenda, so I'm just going to ask um, council staff um, in, in the climate action plan, I know that there's a lot of uh, new uh, changes uh, from the state level on, on concern about this and potential funding partnerships. If we could keep that in mind as we um, are going to be talking about this at some future point, that would be great to have the information that the state has or the feds, federal government has on potential partnerships and fundings on this as well. Uh, Mike. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of City Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, my name is Mike Baria. I'm the Chief Information Systems Officer for the City under the direction of the Finance and Information Systems Department. This evening we'll be discussing the Council Chamber Audio Visual System Refresh Project. Our goal tonight is to provide background information regarding the current Council Chamber AV system, the processes we've gone through to date to assess the state of the system, and the need for a system refresh designed and an overview of the new design. Uh, before sending the designed project out to bid, we wanted to have a check-in with Council and give you the opportunity to ask any questions. First, a little bit of background information. Much of the AV equipment currently in place within the Council Chamber dates back to the initial construction of City Hall, was designed in approximately 2011 and put in service in 2012. While the system has served the city well over the past decade, um, many of the uh, components have reached the end of their usable life. In addition, advancements in AV technology over the past decade have made it difficult to service or scale the system to meet the needs of the city. In a minute, I'll turn the presentation over to the AV consultant who will expand on the challenges of the current system and the opportunities that our new system would bring. The project itself is in the approved CIP budget uh, with funding already in place. In March of 2021, we released a request for qualifications for AV consulting services. In April of 2021, staff reviewed and scored all responses and ultimately selected the Shallot Collaborative to provide AV consulting and design services. Staff begin, began working with the consultant on the system designs in May of 2021 with the objectives of bringing the council chamber AV technology up to date improving the efficiency and ease of use, as well as the ongoing support, administration, and maintenance of the AV system, designing a system that could better scale to the needs of the city. After our check-in tonight, uh, the next step in the process is to take the designs out, uh, the design project out to bid. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Ian Hunter, principal and audiovisual leader for the Shallot Collaborative to present an overview of the propo proposed design. Thank you, Michael. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. All right. I've prepared a quick slide deck in uh, association with Michael and Kerry and staff. I will start that now. And press the magic button. Everything okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So we just wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of uh, why we're going about this, Michael touched on it briefly, what it will look like, how we'll engage with the public, what new features might be. We'll talk a little bit about some of the other rooms and the overflow support, as well as warranty, and then finally a project timeline. Uh, Michael touched on some of these items, but essentially the equipment has reached its end of life, so the age of equipment, the inability to support it, and the uh, warranty uh, expiration are all kind of bearing on 
Michael and his team's ability to continue to deliver the great broadcasts that they do now. And as Michael mentioned, the replacement funds have been uh, set aside. Um, this uh, difference from what you have now, so down in the bottom left is kind of a, a pre-COVID broadcast that I pulled off of your uh, uh, website feed. So you can see it's a standard definition and the aspect ratio is like your old TV used to be. Um, so I just pulled a couple of these shots from, this is Austin, Texas, but to give you the idea that you will be able to have tighter, high definition shots uh, when an individual person is speaking, as well as wider HD camera shots. So when you're pulled back, uh, similar to what you are uh, looking at now, the quality will be much better and you will no longer have the black bars on the side of the, uh, the video. Public and agent methods will stay uh, pretty similar to what you have now on the active side. So Zoom has become a part of everyone's life. That will remain. It will be more tightly integrated. So some of the uh, hiccups and transitions and things will uh, go away. Of course, in person, hopefully soon we'll uh, be back uh, so people can actually come in the chamber and present. Um, and you will still retain the phone and email options that you have currently. Uh, passive engagement, uh, you would stay with the Granicus-like product. And if you wish in the future, you would be able to activate Facebook Live or YouTube or Vimeo or uh, whatever other streaming system uh, you, you would like to do. Two new features that we'd be bringing. Uh, one, uh, I know anytime I've tried to present somewhere, uh, bringing your laptop up and hoping for the right dongle and combination of cables and things can be a bit daunting. So we will have the option to do it wirelessly. If you have uh, an iPad at your house and you can use Apple TV to show it on your TV, it's very similar to that. Um, for the council members and staff members sitting up at the dais, there will be a different microphone that have, has a speaker inside it. It has a headphone jack, so you can plug in if you need to hear a little more clearly. And it has a very large button to activate your mic and deactivate your mic, as well as a very visible uh, lighted ring here uh, to be able to see if your mic is on or not. And if you want to add the function, uh, you can vote via an integral touchscreen there. Uh, don't need to do that, but it is part of the system if you'd like to activate it. And then finally, speaker timer. So we have, uh, this will show up both on video and for people in the room, once they're back in the room. Uh, there's a, a large clock with uh, traffic lights, so it's very clear when the public speaker's uh, time has expired. That same clock will also display on the Zoom feed or the Granicus or the broadcast feed. A few other items uh, for, oops, went too far there. For, uh, I must have an automation thing in here. Sorry about that. Uh, hold, let me try that. Okay, so uh, for some of the other uh, groups that use the council chambers, they don't always have the support of the folks uh, in the back room there in the broadcast booth. So they'll be able to do a simple control of the broadcast from either a computer or an iPad at the clerk station. Um, we will be able to integrate Zoom, as I said earlier, a little tighter into the thing. So rather than kind of a, a, a taped on part now, it becomes just part of the, uh, the overall system. We'll be able to add uh, what is called lower thirds, which is you can see there the, the person's name or the current item that's being discussed, um, any text or logos or things you would like to at the bottom. And um, the great thing about this is um, it's, it's kind of now more of a computer sort of a thing, so we can add and change features over time. If you decide, hey, we don't like the way this is configured, it doesn't require redesigning the whole thing. It's mostly just a matter of software changes. Uh, touching briefly on the other rooms, so you have your closed session room. Uh, we'll be updating the AV in there, so it will operate uh, on its own as a Zoom room if you just want to have a Zoom meeting in there. That will be accomplished by adding a microphone in the ceiling, some speakers on the ceiling, so that you can have all your stuff on the table without blocking microphones or having the, the phone boomerang item. Uh, and then overflow for the community center uh, next door. Uh, oops, wrong one. You will be able to not only watch the uh, council proceedings passively in that space, uh, if you have a, a very large crowd, people in that room can also participate remotely so they could ask questions, have kind of bi-directional communication, kind of like Zoom, except for they would be just down the hall rather than at their house. Uh, 
we specified this with a two year warranty initially, and then uh, what's called an SLA, a service level agreement that provides ongoing tech support. So if, for example, there was an issue that came up during the start of a meeting or during a meeting, Michael and his team would have a phone number that they could call if they weren't able to uh, solve it uh, internally. Timeline and schedule, this is a proposed schedule, of course, uh, up to um, all of the things that have to happen to get a project going, but generally we're targeting notice of award about December 15th, starting construction around March 7th. We anticipate having maybe two to four uh, remote meetings, and then on May 10th, having a first meeting with the new system. Uh, this time, I think, Michael, do we open it up for a Q&A? I have one question about the system. One of the things that I don't like is that the live, when you're not on Zoom and you're live, it's delayed. So then if you decide you wanna ask a question, you seem to be a little bit delayed. Will this feature be li really live or will there be a delay? So the uh, it, it kind of depends on the platform, but are you uh, saying if you're watching it on uh, the Grandcast feed or, or yeah, because some people Where don't want to use at? Zoom. They want to go on the, I guess it's Grankus, yeah. Yeah. So we uh, unfortunately don't have the ability to control that. It's up to the, the folks that run Grankus. So we will get it to them in live time, but it takes their servers a bit of time to kind of cycle through. And it usually, if everything's working right, is about 20 seconds, though it can change based on how however they choose to uh, deliver the content. Okay, so... The other option I saw you post was um, YouTube. Is the YouTube mm -hmm. live live, or is the YouTube from Grankus and also delayed? Uh, they are all a little bit delayed. I've personally found the Grankus to be the the longer delay, and the Facebook and you know Instagram and those to be the shorter delay. But they are a little a little bit delayed, and it it kind of changes in time depending on how busy their their servers are. So it's hard to nail down an exact time for how much it is delayed. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a first Okay, I was just wondering, whatever we can get closest to real time would be fantastic. I I, I do, I, I don't think you're, you're talking about that because they would actually have to call in if it, with a Granicus. So that's a passive, they're not, that's not an interactive screen like our Zoom meetings are. So the Zoom is the one that we are currently using the Granicus is there as the tape recorded one that stays on our on our yeah, site. Yeah, but like sometimes we're watching on Granicus and we don't like you don't think you want to call in, but then all of a sudden you hear something and you want to call in and you're like, shoot, I want to call in, but because there's a delay, sometimes you might not make it. So that's why I was wondering if the, if we could make that tighter. Mm. Okay. Um, can you please clarify? Uh, we had a, a community meeting earlier um, and people that were Zooming to watch it had trouble hearing the speakers. Uh, and you mentioned that a little bit. I just was looking for a little bit more clarification on that. We, we wanna make sure that people can hear the speakers here. They can ask a question. They can raise their hand and be recognized whether they're Zooming in or whether they're in person if it's a hybrid meeting. We wanna make sure we've got that um, easy and equal accessibility. Can you talk about that a little bit please more? Sure, absolutely. I think maybe what you're uh, experiencing is a little bit of the um, the the wonderful that Michael and his team have done in kind of bolting on Zoom to your existing older system, and there are there are quite a bit of um, challenges that come with it. So I, I'm guessing that's probably what you're experiencing. Uh, I haven't experienced it directly, but it sounds like probably the the issue you're talking about. Uh, at the end of uh, the the completion of this. Um, whether participating in the room or on um, Zoom or over the phone, uh, the the audio and the video should be all you know very well integrated and uh, without any of those troubles. And the rooms you. that you're look oh sorry were you done? Oh, you're doing this room and then the um, closed session room. Is there anything we're doing for the community center because that's where we held the meeting and that's where I think um, we had a lot of issues with. Um, 
with the Zoom and being able to hear people and all that good stuff. Is there anything happening in that room? Sure. So we are, uh, I'll say, replacing the the feed that goes over to there. We're not changing any of the, the printers or speakers and stuff in that room, but we are fixing the feed that goes over there. So uh, once that's done, if you're sitting over there watching, it should be the same or better quality that you're experiencing now on Zoom. Okay, now I was wondering, because it was an active community meeting, um, and I know we want to, we talked, oops, we want to give people the option for community meetings to either come in or be on Zoom. So just wondering if there's any opportunity to improve that experience when they're in the community center. Could, could I just jump in on make sure we're talking the same thing? You're saying the broadcast from the council chambers being received in the community center would be similar to if they're here, not from the community center back to the, the recording. Is that what you're saying? I'm just going to jump in for a second here. I don't know if Ian's having the same problem I'm having, but your audio is um, seems to be cutting out. Um, we're trying to figure out if that's on our side. Or Sounds like we side. need this project. <laughs> I, I was turning my head. That was part of it. Are you, are you hearing the same problem too, Ian? Just making sure. Okay. And I apologize. I could kind of tell what you were asking. Yeah, that was my, I was pulling to, away from the uh, microphone to look at the camera. So but what I want to make sure we, we're on the same page that we are talking about broadcasting from the community center to the recording, making sure that's a quality experience, not, I think what he was saying was broadcasting meetings from the chambers and being received in the community center being just like they were here. But I want to make sure we're talking the same thing. Oops. I turned again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just, it might be just an operations thing later on when we're having community meetings, should we be having them in here? So it might be a totally separate subject because I think there was some deficiencies having that meeting there. Um, people told me they were on Zoom, they didn't get called on, but it, it just seemed a little chaotic versus when we're in here. So yeah. it's just probably just an ops question that we can manage every time we have town halls. Thank you. Are there any more questions uh, of staff right now? Okay, then seeing none, we will open public comment. I'll turn it to you, Margaret. I received zero written public comments on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature and I'll call upon your name if provided and I'm mute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. And I currently have one hand raised. I'll call on Rod. Rod, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Margaret. Um, I just want to say as somebody that's uh, been watching these meetings off and on for the last several years, probably since about 2017, this is something that's uh, very welcome. I think it's going to have a, a major positive impact on community involvement. Um, the old videos were pretty much unwatchable. I understand um, in 2012, you know, the technology wasn't wasn't so bad, but um, I've, I've tried occasionally watching these meetings on a large screen, you know, decent uh, uh, resolution TV, and, and they're just unwatchable. You, even, even now, just watching on Zoom, it's so much better as they're able to put the camera on um, each council member as they speak, and you're so much clearer, it's easier to see you, and it's, it makes it easier to participate and understand what's going on. Um, I was very happy to see YouTube as a, as a potential there. Um, in the time since the, the old system was made, YouTube has become uh, a staple. It's, uh, it's something that's available on every computer. It's on every streaming platform. Um, anybody that's got any kind of streaming or even just a smart TV can watch these things in their living room now while they're, you know, or any place in the house where they have a TV. They don't have to make a special trip just to go to a computer. So really like that. It's very nice. Um, YouTube Live. Uh, has a commenting system, not in the sense of public comments, but the actual where people can just type comments and um, they can be viewed. Um, I'd be interested if it's, you know, I, with within whatever limitations the Brown Act might place, if, um, if the public could make actual text comments while the meeting was going on, um, whether the council would be able to see those or not. It would be kind of fun. It would really drive engagement. So uh, really, uh, Want to thank the, the the people. I don't I don't know the names of the people that are, are doing all the um, the AV stuff downtown these days. But you guys are doing a great job. Really appreciate it. And um, I, I think uh, 
cannot be overstated the importance of, of the things that you do to help keep this community involved. Thank you. I have no additional speakers with their hands raised. Okay, at this time then we will close public comments, uh, open council discussion. I do have something I'd like to ask. Um, the touchscreen voting component, what do we think about that? I like it, yep. Yep. I, I, I do have another question. So currently, <laughs> when we're on Zoom, um, and we'll actually see somebody else's screen when public comments come up, um, and it's somebody else's sharing their Zoom screen. Um, I think today's is a little different, or maybe it's not, but it's it's been a little frustrating. So we'll actually have the Zoom in front of us so that we can scroll up and down and see who's um, who's participating via Zoom, or will it also be projected off of somebody else's screen? Because right now it's it's just being shared to us. Uh, thanks, Councilmember Barry. That's something that we're looking at right now, and we're exploring uh, options to bring the participant list um, to you so that you can scroll through it during the meeting. Yeah, I, I sat there with my mouse trying to get the darn <laughs> thing to scroll, and it was like, how come the mouse is moving all over the screen? And it was because it wasn't my mouse moving all over the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm super excited about the YouTube, like Rod Floor said. I'm also super excited about the Facebook Live because that gives the ability of people to share it out and get even more engagement, which I think is phenomenal. Um, so I'm a bit of uh, different. Like I'm used to working on three screens. So here I have my laptop with the agenda open. Um, I would have another screen with the general plan, but I don't have a third screen, so I have the general plan and then the Zoom is on a screen. Are we gonna still just have one screen and are we gonna have multiple screens and do we have the functionality like control find and scrolling up and down and you know looking at different stuff or is the functionality for us as council people still gonna just be this static thing? Yeah, that's all, that's, thank you, Council Member Mendoza. That's one of the things we're looking at uh, similar to what Council Member Rary asked is giving you guys more ability to interact at the dais and staying within city policy and procedures as far as what, what we can do at the dais. But we, we are definitely exploring that right now. Okay, awesome, thank you. Multiple screens, multiple screens and everything, yes. Look at that, <laughs> thank you. Does the new Apple eyeglasses have a component of potential use in the future? I, uh, I, rec I rescind that request. Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, Michael and Ian, uh, for, for your information. Um, seeing that there's no uh, action required of council, um, I, I think, though, that there is enough interest uh, by council for the touchscreen voting component to that, for that to be considered. It uh, would be really interesting to see how that would integrate. Uh, we'll move on to item D5. Uh, considering the continued use of teleconferencing in line with AB 361. And uh, Katie Wazinski will now present the item. Katie. Good evening again. If you'll give me just one minute to pull up my presentation. Let's see. I think we're good. All right. So good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm very pleased to get to update you tonight on some recent changes to the state law. Specifically, I'd like to provide an update on teleconferencing and public participation in meetings after the passage of AB 361. 
This new law affects how we hold our public meetings in times of an ongoing emergency, such as we are currently experiencing with COVID-19. This item will be brief and could really have been included on consent, but we wanted to bring it to your attention and highlight it for the public. Oops, let's see. Hmm. Thank you. So first, just a note on the language that we'll use tonight. We're going to be discussing changes to the Brown Act, which as you know, governs how public meetings of local legislative bodies, such as yourselves, are conducted. Under the Brown Act, teleconferencing means, quote, a meeting of a legislative body, the members of which are in different locations, connected by electronic means, through either audio or video or both. So while we might be accustomed to thinking of teleconferencing only as a telephone call with multiple participants, the state uses that term for meetings that include video as well. So that would include Zoom, WebEx, et cetera. Prior to, the, prior to COVID, the Brown Act generally assumed that most public meetings would be held in person. There was, however, an option for teleconferencing under certain limited conditions. In those instances, the public had to be allowed to be at the location from which the remote member was participating. The agenda had to be posted at the location at which the member was participating. The location had to be accessible to members of the public, presumably meeting ADA standards. And generally, a majority of the members had to participate from within their jurisdictional boundaries. Other than that, however, there were no additional public participation avenues specified because it was assumed that the public would be in the same room as the remainder of the body. Everything changed in January of 2020. That's when we first learned of the novel coronavirus. By March of that year, the governor had declared a state of emergency and Brentwood's own declaration of a local emergency came later that month. We also, in March of 2020, saw the first executive orders issued by the governor to start addressing how the work of the government at all levels could continue when we couldn't physically gather together. Your last city council meeting with members of the public actually in attendance in the chambers took place in June of 2020. And by July of 2020, we had gone fully remote. And until very recently, that's how we had continued operating. To date, our remote meetings have not been possible due to changes in the Brown Act, but because of some of the executive orders that have been issued by the governor. This is a partial list of some of those orders. A number of these provided cities with legal mechanisms to hold remote public meetings without violating state law, and we've been operating under these provisions all these months. To that end, in order to meet the requirements of these executive orders and ensure continued public participation opportunities in your meetings, the city has implemented a number of measures. First and foremost, meetings have been held using virtual video conferencing platforms, such as WebEx and Zoom, to create a virtual gathering place for our legislative bodies, members of the public, and staff. The city has also provided a telephone participation option for providing public comment during meetings. In addition, as each item is called, the city clerk has been presenting summaries of public comments submitted prior to the meeting on the, each item. And finally, when items come before the council that require the submission of landowner ballots through the close of the public hearing, a staff member has been stationed by the door of city hall during the meeting to accept any ballots that have been submitted. The executive orders that allowed remote meetings have now expired. In their place, AB 361 is meant to provide a long-term fix to address how local legislative bodies can meet remotely when emergencies make traditional meetings impossible or pose risks to public health. This does not displace the old teleconferencing rules it just adds new provisions for use of teleconferencing during emergencies. 
AB 361 specifically provides that the public cannot be required to submit their comments only in advance of the meetings. This requirement is already met in our existing procedures. In addition, the new law requires that opportunities for real-time participation, participation must be ensured. This requirement is also met through our existing procedures. And finally, a new requirement has been added such that in the event of a disruption that prevents broadcasting the remote meeting using audio or video based options, or if there's an event of disruption within the city's control that prevents members of the public from offering public comments in real time, the legislative body is prohibited from taking any further action from items appearing on the agenda until public access is restored. You might remember that we have preemptively canceled public meetings when such disruptions were threatened. There was a bridal gate public hearing that was scheduled for some time ago now that had to be canceled at the last moment because of a potential PG&E uh, public safety power shutoff. But this requirement that we had previously taken on ourselves is now required of all cities through the AB 361 process. In addition to these requirements, the Brown Act standing provisions related to providing public notices, posting agendas, meeting ADA accessibility requirements and the like continue to apply. So in order to hold public meetings via teleconferencing, certain findings are required of every local legislative body. Every 30 days, findings will need to be made for our bodies that the circumstances of the state of emergency have been reconsidered, and then that either of the following two circumstances continue to exist. One, the state of emergency continues to directly impact the ability of the members of the of members to safely meet in person, or state and local officials continue to impose or recommend measures to promote social distancing. For the purposes of making these findings tonight, first, we are still in the midst of a declared emergency due to COVID-19. Second, Contra Costa County's public health officer has released recommendations updated on September 9th um, that include recommended measures to promote social distancing. Thus, the required findings can be made for Brentwood's legislative bodies to continue to meet via teleconferencing at this time. AB 361 requires these findings to be made every 30 days in order to continue to use this type of teleconferencing. Staff will therefore include these resolutions as a standing item once a month on your future agendas. They will likely be included on the consent calendar going forward, but as I said, we wanted to bring this item to your attention and the public's attention for this initial introduction. In terms of procedure, the city has a number of, of legislative bodies. First, the city council, of course, which has a number of subsidiary bodies as shown here. All of your standing council subcommittees and all of our local commissions and committees. In addition, we also have some co-equal bodies of the city council. Those would be the successor agency to the former redevelopment agency and the Brentwood Infrastructure Financing Authority. In order to allow the city's legislative bodies to continue to provide remote public participation options and carry on with teleconferencing, staff recommends that the city council, one, adopt a resolution on behalf of the council and all subsidiary bodies, two, adopt a second resolution on behalf of the successor agency, and third and finally, adopt a resolution on behalf of the Brentwood Infrastructure Financing Authority as per the requirements of AB 361. You have all three resolutions in the packet before you tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there any questions of Kate? Okay, seeing none at this time, then we will open public comment. I received zero written public comments on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature and I'll call upon your name if provided and unmute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after your timer has expired. And I see no hands raised. 
Okay, at this time then we will close public comment and uh, move into council discussion. And if no further discussion, then uh, do I have a motion for council vote? I make a motion as detailed in the staff report, adopt a resolution approving the continued use of teleconferencing for meetings of the city council and subsidiary bodies. We have a first. second. We have a second. All in favor, aye. 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 Uh, it is unanimous. Uh, do I have a motion for the agency vote? I'll make the same motion as detailed in the staff report. Adopt a resolution approving the continued use for telecom of co teleconferencing for successor agency meetings. We have a first. Second. And a second. All in favor, aye. 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 It is unanimous. Uh, do I have a motion for the BIFA authority? I will make a motion as detailed in the staff report, adopt a resolution approving the continued use of teleconferencing for BIFA meetings. We have a first. Second. And a second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. We will move on to requests for future agenda items. Um, F1, if you have a new agenda request, uh, is there anyone that has I, I do. I, I would like to make a request that we send a letter to the Board of Supervisors um, regarding uh, the use of Measure X funds and um, not just the resolution that we pass, but, you know, reiterating to them not only um, that we supported this, um, that, that, the all the materials that came out said that fire was like the top thing to be to be funded um, actually three out of four of their commercials had fire as the leading item and the fourth one it was the second item that was listed as the most important thing to be funded and it wasn't specific to East Contra Costa either it was um, Contra Costa fire as well and other agencies and also um, include the percentage of the amount of voters in this area that voted for it. over 50 percent of the voters in our area passed not just in Brentwood but also Oakley passed Measure X and it was because of East County that Measure X passed um, so um, I, I think these are things that we need to let them know that, you know, please, please don't do a bait and switch. <laughs> let us, you know, keep to your word and fund the, the projects that you said you're going to fund with Measure X funds. Councilman Meyer. Um, as I mentioned earlier this evening, I would like to bring a discussion of the general plan conservation and open space element as originally intended in May and uh, misspoken by me. Um, I'd like to understand which of the components of this element are something that we can do short term, something that's more long term. Um, I want to make sure in the area, the progress in the area of climate change and reduction of greenhouse gases doesn't sit on the shelf for another seven years. I think we need to get a little bit more aggressive with <coughs> implementing these programs. Um, I know there's a lot going on right now with planning and the housing element, et cetera. So I would like to see this come back as a discussion item as it typically would um, as soon as possible, but potentially maybe we could even decide that it would be on, and maybe this is a Damien thing, actually be a, an agenda item for vote once that the housing element deadline is passed so that we can actually ad uh, address that individually. Does that make sense? No. Yeah, you look confused. No. <laughs> I'm trying to think the timing of that. So that could be a year, year and a half from now. Are you saying hold no, this, this in place? I'm not saying that. I'm saying um, I don't want to, I'm not saying it needs to be on the agenda for a vote while we're still in the midst of uh, the initial, you know, housing element project. Um, I think if we were to put it off a few months, just so that we could have the discussion and the vote and then start implementing, but I want an actual solid timeline and a priority list, not just a, we'll get to it when we get to it, but like something a little bit more solid. Do you want to pick a time frame in your motion or your recommended agenda item? Like, Is that something I should do now or should I do it when if it's- If you want to propose a delay, a delay, <laughs> a delayed time frame, that would certainly 
Okay, so. Well. If I may jump in, Please I do. believe that part of the discussion would would more appropriately occur at your next meeting. Okay. This is just adding it for a discussion for the next meeting, and then you can explain just what the timing you're okay. looking at. With, with that motion, because she's talking about timing, we got a list of projects or meetings we're going to be having. Can you bring back that meeting so that we're talking about her timing? We know what else we have going on, so we're not... You know, so we're slotting it appropriately. We're not just sticking it somewhere without full in, you know, line of sight to everything else that we have going on. So, so those, you know, those are a list of special meetings. This yes. could be on a regular meeting. We do haven't shown what that schedule looks like. But. Yeah, but if you could bring those special meetings so that when we're talking about timing, because um, we it takes us a long time to read everything, just like it takes you a long time. So if I have special meetings, I, I would like to know what is going on around the time when she brings that forward. Sure. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question, and this is uh, pertaining to Council Member Rary's request, which I support as strongly as can be possible. Uh, the, the timing of this letter is really important. Is it possible, uh, or would, would it suffice you, uh, Council Member Rary, to give direction to staff to form this letter before the next council meeting for this conversation? I'm, I'm, Absolutely. I'm in total support. A absolutely. It's it's something that is urgent. It will take place before our next board meeting or before our next council meeting. Or wait, where are we at? You know, we'll we'll have another council meeting. Before well, then. yeah. If we follow our normal process, you run out of time. So if we can draft a letter and have it on the agenda for the October 26 meeting, that would precede their November 2nd. Yes. Board of Supervisor meeting. Sounds have perfect. That in time. Okay. We will do that. And just to clarify, the rules of procedure do permit that to occur, that the city manager can take the initiative on something like this, given the, the nature of the issue. So it, it falls within the rules of procedure without you having to come back to discuss spending staff time and resources on it. Yeah, it won't be a 10-page letter, but a one-pager maybe or two to get the, get the message across. Can yeah. I clarify your ask real quick? Did you want it to be specific on ask of, like, this is your marketing, this is what you did to go to market, this is why it was. Um, you want some voter statistics in there too so that they understand the impact that it I, made. I, I don't think we can say much more because this is my request right yeah, now. Yeah, but on your request, are you, did you want that specific? specific I, I, that was what I had asked for, yes. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure. Okay, thanks. And what will be on the agenda is our draft version, and if it's not quite what you're thinking, you, by motion, can incorporate some additional content into that letter. So we'll make sure it's right. Okay, thank you. So if there are no further future agenda request items, then we will move into item F2, uh, and Vice Mayor Rodriguez will explain his request. Yes, um, thank you for putting this on the agenda. Um, so I know through the pandemic, I live pretty close to the skate park. Uh, my sons and my family, we go to the park a lot there at the Veterans Park. Um, seen a huge increase of young people using the park, but also adults. And obviously sitting there, uh, people realized my position here in the city, what I was involved in, but also just being able to see it myself um, and getting into some discussions with people that are out there. So one of the things that I, uh, the reason why I wanted this on the agenda was to discuss the concerns about the hours decreasing um, in November. I think it goes down to about six o'clock. Uh, people don't, I mean, what I'm hearing is they don't really, the hours are good now. I know there's a lot of different issues also when it comes to safety, the parking lot. So they're not asking for hours to be increased to like 10 o'clock, but for hours to stay the same. But for that to happen, what I'm asking is if we could spend some time to look at possible increasing the lighting in that area uh, because it gets dark. I was out there seven o'clock the other night. It was pretty dark and the park was, it was still open. Um, I think it's closing right now at about 7.30, 8 o'clock. And like I said, in November, I think it's gonna go to six. To increase the lighting, so um, there's certain dark spots in that area, it could become a safety issue. I know I saw a mom out there with two real little ones. I mean, I would say three or four years old and they're little things. And um, she's out there trying to watch her kids and it's pretty dark. She's telling them, just stay in this area where there was lighting. So maybe looking at that. Also, uh, there, we do have a, a one light that's actually out currently. that's already there, that's not working. Um, increasing maybe garbage cans. I know that it gets a little messy in there. Um, they've done pretty well. I know it's, the graffiti's not as bad as I've been to other skate parks where 
it's really bad. Um, I know currently we do have a little bit of graffiti on one of the poles and maybe having that cleaned up. Um, another thing was the shade structure. There's no shade, so one of the things that if we can, and obviously it's just a request, right, we're a discussion, but I know there's not a lot of shades where the actual benches are at. They actually, and I was trying to look at how would that even work, but we have shade when you're walking into the facility. There's like an overhang kind of a thing, maybe trying to develop, uh, us exploring the possibilities of doing that in the same area. Um, and then also the other concern was, is that currently we use um, almost pavers in certain areas where the, the, where the uh, benches are at, the kids are going over, and that could also, the pavers have moved. They have, a, um, some have shrunk a little bit more than others, so it's a little bit um, not leveled, and it could be also a safety issue. Um, I guess what I'm asking for is just, just be able to explore those things that are, one, probably con that are concerns, but also um, that maybe we could add and do a little bit more there for those residents and for those kids. Um, it's packed. That place is packed. I don't know. I think the pandemic, everybody was trying to find things to do, and a lot of these kids became either skaters. Um, they used a little, um, I don't know what they call those, scooters, bikes. I think I bought one of everything through the pandemic for my kids. Um, so, and just saying that, it's been a, a, I'll be honest, a big resource to our community to be able to have not only youth, but also a lot of adults that are utilizing that facility. So, just a couple of things that I, by sitting there and taking notes um, with some of the kids and talking to parents while they were there. Um, just those are a few things if we could look at either adding or cleaning up or, you know, things like that. So if anybody has any okay. questions. Thank you. Um, before we go into the council uh, discussion, at uh, this time we will open public comment. Uh, Margaret. I received no written comments on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature and I'll call upon your name if provided and I mute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. And I have no hands raised. Okay, at this time we will close public comment and move into council discussion. Um, we just reviewed the uh, parks hours and uh, it was four years ago when we had the 12 and 13 year olds and, and anytime there's been changes to the skate park, it's, it's been by, by youth coming in here. I mean, the, the skate park itself was, was developed because a group of, actually there were scouts, a group of scouts came together and said, hey, we need a skate park. And so the skate park, park skate task force was developed and they created that skate park. And then probably within 10 years, a 14 year old came in and said, hey, we need to be able to have our BMX bikes in there. We, you know, we, we wanna do this too. So it, it went through the council and it, uh, then BMX bikes were in there. And then we had that 12 and 13 year old and boy, that 12 year old was, actually he's on the youth commission. He is on the youth commission. Uh, he, he, I, I told him the mayor better watch out because he'd <laughs> make a great mayor um, anyway, or, or a council member. But um, we did increase the hours um, of the, the skate park um, at that time. And it, it's always been driven by kids coming in here and doing it. And while, you know, increasing it till seven o'clock, I mean, I, I, I having more lights out there, um, the cost of that and the screening, I, I think that's something that if it's a project that you'd like to do, maybe bringing that up at the strategic planning sessions um, where we're, we're looking at funding options rather than throwing another item out there to be finding out, to try to find money in our budget to fund that. Um, fixing a light and the pavers, I mean, that should all be part of, of park maintenance as it is, but um, I, I think adding a light or that, that should, it, and the, the shading should wait till the strategic planning session. Yeah, um, I, that was kind of my thought. I feel like there's buckets of things. So there's regular maintenance that sounds like it needs to happen. So we should probably, that's the maintenance bucket. And I don't know if you want to email maybe Bruce a list of all the maintenance maintenance items that are lacking. 
Um, I do remember shade structures being part of strategic plans. So yeah, maybe let's talk about that in November, um, the, stage, the, uh, the shade structures and all of that good stuff. And um, then we have to, we're forced to force rank things like what do we want, what do we not want? And we can go from there. And if, um, if we're gonna look at this park, there's a lot of parks that kids use at night. I mean, the basketball courts, trust me, there's a lot of kids at the basketball courts. So maybe that's something we wanna talk about during the strategic um, initiative meeting also. And Bruce can give us some insight on hours and <coughs> why we do things, because I don't know why we close at a certain time or, you know, because I mean, my kids don't skate, but my daughter would be out there playing basketball till midnight if the lights were on till midnight. So I think there's a lot of kids that would love it, but. I know that some things are not feasible. So um, maybe when we're having the strategic plan meeting, we can talk about, you know, from a security reason or a resource reason, a payroll reason, like why do we do things? Because I don't have the insight. But um, yeah, I think it's a good idea, but I think it's a good idea to kind of look at all of our parks and see if there's any opportunities. And it seems like garbage is coming up a lot lately. Um, Vice Mayor Rodriguez just mentioned it. I've heard it from people a lot lately about the garbage. So I think people are using our parks more during COVID. So maybe we need to look at the schedule for pickups or we need to look at additional containers at other parks. Yeah. Oh, am I going off? Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, that, that was my opinion about that. Vice Mayor, would, would giving uh, city staff a heads up that this will be coming back in November yeah yeah no no I, I just I mean I wasn't planning for a miracle tonight right or anything to start being built tomorrow um, but at least it starts to create the conversation right if it's now or November I just know that I mean if we need to bring 50 youth and that makes a difference then maybe that's something we explore um, my whole thing is that you know this is just my personal this is sitting out there being out there talking to residents talking to young people and actually it was approached to me to even think about doing talking to anybody because I normally try to stay by myself when I'm in those areas but is yeah I mean I'm not in a rush for it now but I, uh, I'm like I think Councilmember Mendoza said there's uh, basic maintenance things that we can do right uh, fix the light uh, maybe look at the, the pavers and those kind of things uh, and then the additional stuff like more shade and things like that are I'm totally open to those discussions in November when it comes to the strategic plan, yeah. Okay, so I, I can jump in a little bit. So from the maintenance standpoint, Bruce is actually participating virtually, so he's already taken note, I'm sure, of the additional trash cans, the paver conditions, and any graffiti abatement that needs to occur post haste. The shade structures and hours and lighting and all that, maybe if that could, could stay and hold on for the strategic plan sessions, that might be appropriate to then see what other funds are available and other projects or priorities and go from there. But we can at least take care of those maintenance things. Yeah. Right and and I do, I do want to, because um, there's a lot of graffiti at skate parks, and I'll be honest with you, I think Brentwood has done a wonderful job in maintaining that skate park and as nice as it is. Uh, um, so, yeah, so kudos to whoever's doing that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, just a little bit more, how we could add a little bit more just to make it a little more comfortable. So thank so you. So what is a good time to bring up the 24-7 app? Oh, Can that be addressed now? Is no, he's shaking his head now. <laughs> Honorable Mayor, members of City Council, as Councilmember Meyer suggested, this really is for the skate park discussion that uh, the Vice Mayor brought up. It would be appropriate. The, the agenda item um, I don't know what the has hours. has the uh, <laughs> City Council um, agreeing to spend staff time and resources, or spend time and resources in a period of scheduling. It would be appropriate to make a motion if, if the council so desires to have this item come back for the strategic initiative process as described and discussed by the city manager. And then that will just, it'll formalize the action so that it, 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 it'll be on the agenda then for that, for that meeting. I'd like to make a motion that this be agendized in the strategic plan discussions. And I'll um, second that. That's one of the items. Yeah. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 It is unanimous. Okay, Can I ask really quick though, what is the 24? So I mean, I'm a we, little, I got a little lost there for a minute. We have a reporting uh, application for residents to cite where they have code issues or oh, okay. trash issues, and they can report it. Sorry. It automatically then gets funneled <laughs> to the correct department and the right personnel in those departments for 
for action, then they report back to the resident. Should have probably known that, huh? No? Okay, should have asked that question. <laughs> I will say from personal experience that uh, it works very well and city staff is always right on top of it. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a, an excellent app to have for our community. Thank you, Council Member Meyer. Uh, we will move on to item F2.2 uh, and we'll have Council Member Mendoza explain her request. Yeah, so my request came about after receiving an email from Bruce and Park and Rex. Um, we are at 3.28 acres per 1,000 people for parks, and it's concerning. There is an acre that has become available in the city. It's across from Pioneer at 2001 Shady Willow Lane. And it is adjacent to the green belt on grants. So it's not, incrementally, it's not as much more to maintain because all of our workers are already gonna be there. Um, I envision this being kind of one of those exercise courses and they're very popular like Escondido just put five of them in their cities all over putting them in it's just a standalone area where you can do exercise and I think it would fit in perfectly. I also like it because it's right across from a school and um, when parents drop off their kids and gather together that creates community so I see it as not only a place to for people to hang out like kids to hang out but I also see it as a place for parents to get together and create community because I mean I know I made a lot of my friends through my kids so um, and that kind of brought me into the neighborhood and meeting people when we moved here from the East Bay so I don't know if we need to talk about now I wouldn't know I would also be okay with putting it on the um, the strategic plan meeting that we're gonna have um, and talking about it then but we need to catch up we are again I said at 3.2 acre 3.28 acres and um, with what we have on the docket will be at 3.98. I also think it was a bit of a, it was sad. It wasn't a bad thing to give land to the fire department. I'm all about that. It's just sad that we had to take it from our park inventory. And I think it was four or five acres. I can't remember. So I think this is a way of also giving back this community, which a lot of them were expecting this big park a little bit back of what we had to take away for the betterment of the entire city. So that's it. Okay, at this time, we will open public comments. Uh, Margaret? I received no written public comments on this item. If you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature, and I'll call upon your name if provided and I mute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person, and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. And I do have one hand raised. Rod, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Yeah. Um, I I'll be brief. I'm getting an echo in my headset, so excuse me. Uh, I'll be brief. I, I just want to say uh, I was here the night that uh, the vote was taken to um, surrender the other park to, for the fire department. And um, I think I spoke pretty enthusiastically that night that uh, this was something that we should really do as much as I hate, hate, hate losing park space. Um, I, I thought it was really important. I think there's nothing more important than fire safety and the situation here has been so bad for so long. Um, but I do think it makes a great deal of sense that since the fire department was originally going to be just a firehouse and just on that acre, as I understand it, um, as I sat through all the PA1 meetings. Uh, so I think that since we gave up a larger park space for that, for the fire department and their administrative building, I just think it makes so much common sense to make this space a park um, because uh, as has been pointed out, we're so very short. Thank you so much. I have no additional speakers. Okay, at this time we'll close public comment and move to council discussion. You know, when, when we originally looked at that acreage for the firehouse, <clears throat> my assumption was that we'd switch the old firehouse to become a park. Um, I don't see anything that precludes us from looking at the general plan amendment to change that to a park and then bring the construction part of it and funding to the strategic planning session. Um, and then it all goes back to the park and rec uh, commission anyway to finalize all the rest of that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would not have a problem with moving forward with a general plan amendment on that to, to change that over to a park. And then again, um, 
look at the funding source during the strategic plan, just like the, the lighting for the skate park. Um, I would I would support what Councilman Barreri said. I'm 100% in support of the idea of converting this to parks. Uh, it's an investment in our residents and their quality of life. I think I think every one of them would support us making this decision. I, sh I shouldn't say that. I don't speak for everyone. Speaking for myself, but um, I personally think it's a fantastic idea, and I would absolutely support it. I think this is another item that would be great to have on our strategic plan meeting. So I, I also agree with Council Member Mendoza that we put that on the agenda during the strategic plan in November. Okay, do we have a motion? So I'm actually, I hadn't thought about the general plan amendment because I don't even know about that stuff yet. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I make a motion as uh, Council Member Rary said, let's um, move forward with the general plan amendment and let's protect that land, make it park land. And then um, in November, we will add it and see what we can do moving forward. Damien? Second. I'm just listening to the motions and what's before the council on the agenda. I believe you're going to be coming back far sooner than you'll need, than, than the general, any general plan amendment will come back to you for the strategic plan discussion. That's going to come first. You may want to have that discussion first, see where that goes, and then if there's a desire to move forward with the general plan amendment, come back and direct staff to do that at that time. It, it, it might just be a little bit cleaner that way to, to have the, the funding discussion first, make sure you want to go in that direction, and then look at, at changing things. So you want us to do November 1st and then the general plan amendment? It, it, just from a timing-wise, yeah, there's, a, there's nothing's a, going to come back before, before there's you There's going to be a plan budget. Amendment. There's going to be time and resources. It's probably three months to do a general plan amendment. So there's, you have to go to the planning commission the planning first. Sure we secure those funds. Yes. And then we'll take care of the paperwork. I think that order will flow better. Okay, so yeah. I will reverse my order. We will bring this forward in November to the strategic plan meeting. Oops. We'll, um, so reversing the order. So number one, we'll bring this forward in our November meeting to review the strategic plan. And then we move forward to the general plan amendment after that. Second. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It is unanimous. Okay. Um, at this time, uh, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. We have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you. Everybody be safe. <laughs>